One of the most heartbreaking things that I've read this week, I, 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 I'm not a, a, a person that watches a lot of news on the television. I end up feeling depressed when I do. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of, well, I'm not kind of, I'm sick and fed up with the hate mentality that has been generated in our, in our society over the last couple of years. And so, I, you know what? I'm not going to subject myself to that stupidity. And so I don't. But I do follow the news uh, in, in other ways. And I was reading a news article that came out in our local paper that I was reading online. And, uh, and if you follow news, you heard it. 17-year-old boy uh, had, had made or put on Facebook, I believe it was, or one of the social medias and was being thankful that he had made it to his 17th birthday. And that particular day was his birthday. His mother had gone to pick up a cake or something to celebrate the birthday. And uh, he himself had gone to a, another place of business to pick up the food for the party that they were going to have. One hour after he placed on Facebook, that he said, I'm thankful that I've, I've lived to my 17th birthday. One hour later, a drive-by shooting took place and they shot him in the head and killed him right on the street. That penetrated my heart to think that we're living in a world and a nation that life is not considered of any value. My friend, it's time that we begin to understand we're not in a game, we're in a war. We're in a war for our prophets and our priests of tomorrow. We're in a war for our families of tomorrow. And if this generation, moms and dads and grandparents, does not take a stand for what is right and become people that live a life that they can honestly not fear their children emulating them, we're in trouble. It's going on everywhere. It is not just confined to America. It's around the world. The divorce rate has escalated to epidemic proportions. Suicides. According to some of the latest statistics, the ages from 11 to 15, numbers of children are taking their lives for various reasons. Life has no meaning whatsoever. We are in a war. But I stand before you today to say to you that my faith is everything is going to be all right. My God has not forsaken us. My God has not turned his back on us. With that being said, let me say this. As bad as what I've just said is, the fact yet remains there's more good than bad going on. There are more good people than evil people. There are more honest people than dishonest people. There are people that love their children, love their husbands, love their wives, love God, and love the church. They're still in America. Don't let the devil distort the truth so much until you feel like it's hopeless. As long as there's a God that we serve and as long as there is somebody somewhere that will love him and serve him, we're going to see victory in the world that seems to be going mad in a war. But let me ask a question to mom and dad. Does this sound a little familiar to you? Speaking of your son, he never listens to me, your daughter. I try and I try, but she never does what I ask. We try to be good parents, but we really know what we're getting through to them. Do you think that it is impossible to raise your kids to be everything that you want them to be? Are you ready to give up trying to influence them. Do they even know you 
exist? Now, I really never had a problem with that question until they became teenagers. All right? Up until they were teenagers, they would walk through a store next to me. After they became teenagers, they would walk five feet behind me. It's either they were ashamed of me or they didn't want anybody to know their dad was an old man. They didn't have the guts to tell me which one. But as a teenager, I began to wonder, do they even know I exist? Have you ever wondered about that influence? You may think your sons and your daughters could care less about what you have to say, but current research suggests that parents have a greater influence upon their children than they realize. Not only are they listening, but more importantly, they are watching closely in modeling their lives after you. Whether you believe it or not, parents are the biggest influence in their children's life. That is a truth. Several studies point to a parent's ability to shape their kids in lasting ways. Part of parenting involves being in a child's life, especially during critical milestones like key birthdays, getting their driver's license, dating their first boyfriend or girlfriend. I personally think a daughter shouldn't be allowed to date until she's 29. Maybe that's why I don't have daughters, all right? Well, I'll have all the girls wanting to fight me before this is over with, all right? No, just kidding, not really, but I'll, okay, to get out of it. All right, their rites of passage are important to most teens. One study revealed that a parent's inactivity or absence during those times has made teens more likely to create their own moments by participating in risky behaviors such as drinking and drug use and early sexual activity and even dangerous driving. So what I'm basically saying and want to get across is people be involved in your children's lives. Don't just think everything will be all right because it won't be all right unless you as a parent, father, mother, grandfather, grandmother are involved in your children's lives. Today, I want to talk to parents concerning the influence that our daily lives have upon those that God has trusted us with. In doing so, I pray that it will help those of us as Christians understand that we also influence the lives of people around about us. You see, though this message in part deals with the influence of a parent, I believe that every Christian should understand that we influence our neighbors. We influence our coworkers. We influence those around us by the way that we live. Our influence holds greater value than most of us realize today. So I want you to understand that though I talk to a parent or to a grandparent or a soon-to-be parent, I'm talking to the overall influence of all of us. I have a question that is the title of my message today. What shadows are we casting? What shadows are we casting? The definition of the word shadow is a dominating presence 
or a dominating influence? What influence are you having upon your children? Where I receive this thought comes from the book of Acts, the fifth chapter, verses 12 through 15. Notice this. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. They were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, and of the rest durst no man join himself to them. But the people magnified them, and believers were the more added to the Lord, multiplied both of men and women. In so much, now listen, in so much that they brought forth the sick and to the streets and laid them on beds and couches. And at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. I left out the next verse, not necessarily for a particular reason, but let me bring it to your attention. When the shadow hit, whoever walked by Peter, they were healed. Instantly, they were affected by Peter's shadow. In other words, he affected those he walked by. There, my friend, was no power in the shadow. It was the power of God in the man that made the shadow that influenced those he overshadowed. I want you to understand as a parent, I want you to understand as an individual, as we walk through life, our shadow affects affects those uh, that we come in contact with. It is but an analogy, but what I want you to understand is your actions, the way you live your life uh, influences the lives of those uh, that God has placed in your care. Every parent, every person here today cast a shadow as you walk through life. Uh, that shadow affects the people that you come in contact with each day. The one it affects, affects the most uh, are your children or your family members. It can cause them to be directed toward the good or toward the bad. My question is, what effect is your shadow or your life having upon your children? You may say, Pastor, I really don't think that it's causing anything. You're totally and completely dead wrong. I come to understand this very much so in December of last year. My wife's dad passed away. I had the privilege of preaching his funeral. A man that I had known all of our married life and the year before and had grown to respect him and to honor him very much along with me ministering, my three sons were asked if they would like to share how their grandfather had affected their lives. Each one of them stood in the pulpit along with a nephew, his other grandson, and shared from their heart how their grandfather, who they call Papa, had affected their lives. And I right then and right there understood the power of influence because each one of them had words to say that were words of respect and honor and things they'd seen in their grandfather that impacted their life. They have not lived around him for 30 some odd years, only visited with him throughout the year occasionally, though they did spend two or three weeks during the summer months when they were growing up.
Now they can tell you some tales of what happened around Papa when they were growing up. One of the particular tales uh, was that now they grew gardens and they uh, Laney loved tomatoes and okra and black-eyed peas and they canned the peas. Well, uh, it happened to be one day they were canning black-eyed peas on the back patio and Alex was there and Eric was there and they began to play around the black-eyed peas uh, and all of a sudden, I don't know, one of them jumped over the peas or did something uh, and that was Eric and then Alex proceeded. Uh, well, according to Eric, uh, Alex spit in the peas. Uh, now, Eric, er, Alex says, I didn't do it. Eric said he did. Guess who Laney believed? Eric. Guess what the results was? Hickory tea. Do you know what hickory tea is? A hickory limb broke off and placed uh, in the place God made it. All right, they've never forgot the influence of their grandfather. Personally, I think a little hickory tea wouldn't be a bad thing today, but that's just me. All right, that's just me there. Okay, his influence. I look at my own father. My father was not a Christian man. He did not take us to church. We went to church. Myself, my brother, my sister, back to the age of six and seven, or seven particular, I started going to church. But my dad was not a church man, though he did take me to my first Pentecostal service as an 11-year-old and to hear and to be a part of a evangelist named Mayhorn that gave me my first first bit of what Pentecostalism was all about. But my dad was a good man. He was not a Christian. He drank a lot. He, he cussed a lot. All right, I remember those things, but he was a good dad. There are certain things about him that to this day stand out in my mind. My dad had a tremendous work ethic. No one had to make him get up and go to work. No one had to make him to provide for his family. He worked diligently to make sure that we had clothes on our back, food on our table, and a house to live in all of our lives. Uh, though our home was broken up in my mid-teens, yet uh, I still remembered a father that had a quick smile and a quick laugh. Uh, I still remember a father that demanded respect but then gave respect. Uh, I remember a dad that when some of the workers that worked under him began to have problems, he pulled them aside uh, and would begin to encourage them. So what am I saying? Uh, I remember the influence of a dad uh, that created within his four sons and daughter a work ethic uh, that carried us through life. Uh, you see, all of my brothers and my sisters uh, were business people. They started their own businesses. Uh, they were successful in their own businesses uh, and ended up being blessed. Why? Uh, because they were affected by the work ethic uh, of a dad that wouldn't quit. Uh, he would work until food was on the table. What am I saying? Dad, uh, be the example for your sons uh, and your daughters that will prepare them uh, for the life that is ahead of them. Uh, for society today says they're entitled to something. Uh, no, if you don't work, uh, you don't eat. Uh, if you don't have a work ethic, don't think you deserve success. <laughs> Influence is an important thing. Very important. Your children watch every move that you make. They watch how you live, what you say, and how you carry yourself. Every parent here today cast a shadow as you walk through life. The shadow affects the people you come in contact with each day. The ones it affects are your children. My question is, what effect is your shadow having on those you love? 
and that God has trusted you with. I thought of this as I was looking at, at this and the question came to mind, where have all the heroes gone? Does your children have a hero? Most children hero today is a pad or a phone where they sit and play games almost without break, mindlessly, all right, playing some, some program or some game that adds very little value to life. I know that I'm, I'm old by some of your standards, but I remember to where the moment we got up, we had to go in the yard. We wasn't allowed to watch television. One reason we wasn't allowed to watch it is because we didn't have one. All right, you can't watch what you don't have. First one we got was a black and white. It wasn't the best one in the world. I learned at the very young age to be electronically minded. All right, we couldn't get the signal. I found out if you got a coat hanger and you took it loose and wound around it, put some tin foil on it, put it on the screw on the back, you could see a picture. The Lone Ranger. All right, yeah. <laughs> I become a master at getting a signal when no one else could. It didn't really matter where you could see it or not. Mother said, hit the yard. The only time you come in the house when it was time for a bologna sandwich. Once you ate your sandwich, you went back in the yard. The next time you came in, it was time for milk and bread. That's what we had for dinner. Pouring a cone bread, glass of sweet milk. That's what they called it back then. They didn't call it homogenized. It was a glass of sweet milk. I have no clue why they called it sweet milk. Okay, but that's what it, well, there's buttermilk, that's sour milk. All right, I guess that's what it was. Mother now did fix big meals. Back then there were five kids. She'd go out and buy groceries. She had a, a plan every week. The milk and bread was a lot when she had to work herself. But mother back then bought enough groceries for seven people. I don't know why I remember, but it cost $21 for enough groceries to last a week. It takes $21 now just to buy enough cereal for a week, all right? But nonetheless, okay, they, they created these influences of productivity upon our lives. But I, I wondered in this, where are the heroes now? Who is it our children can look up to? Who is it that our children can say, that's who I want to be like? In our society today, we need to understand there needs to be somebody that our sons and daughters can look up to. We cease to have any heroes. A hero is someone you can admire, someone that has great courage. The heroes of today were considered murderers, adulterers, fornicators, immoralist thieves, low class yesterday. That's what they were then. But now, my friend, it seems like anybody can tell a lie and it's acceptable. I remember a time uh, where your word was your law and your honesty is what set you apart from everywhere else. It's time uh, that we understood the value of honesty and truthfulness and living a life according to the word of God uh, that sets us apart uh, from the hypocrisy of the society we're living in today. We need some heroes today. As a parent, do you fit the bill? The shadow you're casting either, casting either qualifies you or disqualifies you as a hero. Curtis Hudson wrote a book entitled Great Preaching on the Deity of Christ. And in that particular book, he quoted Billy Sunday, fireball of a preacher, Billy Sunday was, and he made a quote that Billy Sunday had stated. And I believe in these, this quote, you will find the qualities of a hero. In this particular thing that Billy, our brother, Billy Sunday stated, he said a hero is known by four or five different things. Number one, a hero is known by his character. Character being what a person is 
whether it is male or female. Howard A. Walter gives some principles to help define what a person is. I would be true, for there are those who trust me. I would be pure, for there are those who care. I would be strong, for there are those who suffer. I would be brave, for there is much to dare. I would be friend of all, the for the friendless. I would be giving and forget the gift. I would be humble, for I know my weakness. I would look up, I would laugh, I would love, I would lift. There defines character. We need to understand the value of character today, for that is what defines us. It is our character. And then we're known by our conversation, what we say, be it a he or a she. Many people today do not understand the power of words. The words that come out of our mouth lay the course of life for those God has given to us. It's time that we guard carefully this power God has entrusted us with. Be careful the words that come out of your mouth. Be careful that you say, I'm going to do it, but you never do it. Be careful that you say I'm going but I'll never go. You see we move beyond that time to where we can jokingly say to a son or a daughter don't do as I do. Do as I say do. Uh, my friend if you say do it uh, then demand of yourself that you reach the same criteria that you've invested into that child. Uh, if you're not willing to live holy don't claim to be holy. If you're not willing to live a Christian life, don't try to tell your children to live a Christian life. If you're not willing to do it, don't tell them to do it because your words legislate their life and their future and our children becomes reflections of who we are today. I was a stickler, and I know some people don't believe in corporal punishment. I, I, I you know, I, I get that. They don't, they don't believe in that. And, uh, I, and, and I did, and I do. I had no problems taking a belt to our three sons. One of them got more than the other ones did. You say, which one was it? I dare not share. <laughs> All right, not really. I never whipped our sons very much, but I believe in corporal punishment. I believe that there comes a time that you have to do what the Bible says. But I also believe that if you say you're going to do it, do it. Don't threaten. We're in the time of threatening. I've been around parents that threaten their kid 25 times. If you don't do it, I'm going to whip you. If you don't do it, I'm going to put you in a corner. Dear Lord, if I knew that was an option to get time out when I was growing up, I'd have begged for time out. I'd have took time out six hours to keep Daddy from taking a switch to my rear end. All right? Because Daddy didn't know how to do it lightly. When he got through, you knew he'd been, he'd been around. Didn't do it often. But never once, never did my mother say, just wait till your daddy gets home. He'll take care of this. She was a master of taking care of it herself. Yeah. And if we happened to be visiting somewhere and she ever said under her breath, I'll take care of you when I get you home. You had a nervous breakdown for the next two hours because you knew that mama was a woman of her word. I'll never forget it. I couldn't have been more than seven years old. I'm a person that likes everything straight. I can't stand crooked pictures on walls. It irritates me to no end. 
We went into this aunt and uncle's house who had a pristine house. Everything was in shape. And back then, bud, you didn't go in the house and go wandering through people's rooms and checking out their their chest of drawers wasn't looking for anything. You went only where mom and daddy told you to go. And most of the time that was you stopped at the door and stayed outside. But for some reason we went inside. And back then they had living rooms that you only went in once a year, all right? And she had a beautiful living room, but I made a mistake. I looked in the living room and the picture over her couch was crooked. And my little seven-year-old mind couldn't take it. It was crooked. So I proceeded to tell my aunt what she needed to do with her picture. That was the greatest of insults, undoubtedly. I said to her, your picture is crooked. You need to straighten it up under mother's bread. I'll take care of you when you get home. I should have passed out right then because I lived in torment for the next three hours. I knew what was coming. She kept her word. If you tell your kids you're going to do something, keep your word. They know when you lie. If you're not going to do it, don't tell them you're going to do it. Just let them be a heathen. All right. All I'm saying is what we say, carry it out. Look at somebody and say, I think I will. All right. Mother always, daddy always kept their word. Be careful the words that come out of your mouth. A hero is known by his conduct, what he does or what she does. Never in history have we had so many people busy doing so many things and yet accomplishing so little. Could it be possible that we are doing the wrong things? Have we perhaps ceased to understand what is really important? In this thing called life, you may be a doer, but who is the beneficiary of all that you're doing? I am so tired. I'm, I'm, you know, I have Facebook, I have Twitter, I have Instagram. Uh, you know, people follow me for my, basically for my thought for the days and my scriptures and things like that. But inevitably, as I'm scrolling and Placing, I see these people that maybe I knew years ago and, and all of a sudden, for some reason, they feel like I need to know where they are. I need to know what they had for breakfast. I need to know the color of their pajamas, all right, or something like that. And undoubtedly, not only do I need to know it, everybody that follows them, may I tell you something? I could care less what you ate for breakfast two weeks ago. I don't really care where you go to use the toilet at. It don't bother me at all. So I really don't need you to post your personal stuff. Are you hearing me? I'm telling you what, I'm so fed up with knowing what's going on in some people's lives. Uh, I'm saying, you know, the, 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 the less I know, the better off I am. They don't look at me like I'm weird and think, well, that, I don't do that. Let me tell you something. I happen to remember one of your daughters one time placed something on Facebook that would have embarrassed me. And I thought, dear Lord in heaven, should I call mama and tell her what I just saw? I wasn't brave enough. I was afraid the mom would get mad at me and quit paying tithes, so I didn't do it. Hallelujah, I'm just kidding. All right, what I'm saying, let me say something to parents and you teenagers and children, you might ought to stop up your ears right here because it's probably going to aggravate you. Mama and daddy, don't trust your children with Facebook. Don't trust them with Twitter. Don't trust them with Instagram. They are children. They will do what other children are doing. Have you noticed this thing now? It comes up on some of my stuff. What's trending now? All right, and you're supposed to hit that and it'll tell you, I don't ever 
hit that. I don't care what's trending. All I care about is they've given me a platform here that I, I've got about 2,000 people that follow me. I can, I, I can put Jesus loves you. I can put the word of God. It is a platform to spread the gospel. Uh, it's also a way for me to keep in touch with my kids in California and Hawaii. But what I'm saying is, parent, I preached this 30 years ago. Don't just let your kids play any music they want to play. You know what records, what CDs they got. Go in their bedroom, dig under their bed, look between their mattresses. Uh, they are your children. It's your responsibility to know what goes on in their life. I'm going to tell you the way I am, the way I was. Our boys, they got into that teenage dating stuff and going to date this one and date that one. And they were boys. They all had, you know, a bedroom and all this stuff. They left. I'd go up to their bedroom. I'd go through their drawers. I would look in their, under their mattress. I'd look up under their bed. If there was a letter there, I'd open it and read it. All right. You say, oh, you shouldn't have done that. You were invading their space. Let me tell you something. They didn't have no space. I own the house. I own the bed. The clothes they wear, we bought them. What they fix their hair with, I bought it. I paid for their haircuts. I had a right to tell them how to get their hair cut. Now Jonathan was our haircut problem child. He'd want to get this weird hair stuff. He's got to be kin to Troy Wood. That's all I can say. They got to be somehow kin. All right. No. He's always wanting to do this stuff. You know, grow a ponytail. Get an earring. I said, let me tell you. Get a ponytail, get an earring. I'm going to buy you some panties with lace on it. All right. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Aren't you glad you're not my, my young'un? Hallelujah. Finally, I let him grow his hair a little bit. And he, it, it was so weird. I called it the cow pod look. He had this bunch of hair right here on the back of his head. It looked like a cow pod. And then he grew this little old thing that he plaited and let it hang down. It's the weirdest looking stuff I'd ever seen. But me being the loving father, never made fun of him to his face. <laughs> he even lifted it up and let somebody cut out something, initials up under it. That part I never saw. If I'd have seen it, I'd have probably shaved it, all right? What is it? Know what's going on in your children's life. You say you didn't trust your children. I trust my boys. I really did. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Okay, I trust them. I just don't trust the influence of the world around. And they were boys that could get sucked up into society. I, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me give you something. You need to get this. You got little kids. You really need this. Children want parameters. Children want boundaries. They know that as long as they're inside that boundary, you're going to protect them. But once they break out of that boundary, they're on their own. Uh, they want to know how far they can go and be in your protection. You tell them that. Son, 11 o'clock is your curfew. Once you get in on curfew after that, I don't know what's going to go on. What am I saying, folks? Uh, conduct uh, is what makes a good hero out of you. Live the life in front of them, uh, but also demand certain lifestyles out of them uh, and don't let anything change your mind. I don't care what is in fad. Uh, I don't care what is trending. Uh, the word of God laid out the way to do it uh, and so do it God's way. Hallelujah. Somebody sitting there thinking, if I'd have done mine that way, they'd have ran off. Mine never pulled that runoff stuff. They never ran away. They were too hungry all the time. <laughs> 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 
they know they don't they go so far they're going to give out of food because I didn't believe in allowances. Well, I did. Couldn't get far in a dollar. <laughs> what I didn't believe in is you take out the garbage and I'll give you $10. My philosophy was this. If you put anything in the garbage, it's your job to take out the garbage. Amen? Am I being too transparent here? You see, My boys didn't get paid for doing stuff around the house. Where's Alex? Oh, you're behind the camera. Are you agreeing with this? You better. I'm still signing his paycheck. I ain't quit paying him yet, dear God in heaven. I'm still giving the boy money after all this time. But he's working for it now. We didn't pay our boys to work around our house because they lived there, they slept there, they eat there. I helped them buy their first cars. I helped them get insurance. I did all of those kind of things, my wife and I, for them. But the way we live, folks, conduct defines us as a hero. I've got to stop. I've got to stop, okay? Contribution defines a hero. What he or she gives in a world that is wrapped up in the philosophy that is built on getting, it's hard to understand the, mind, the demand of being a giver. God in his infinite love set the example for all, for all of us to follow with these great, great words in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And then last but not least, your creed. Your creed is what you believe. A creed is more than just a statement of religious facts. Did you know you can go to hell and be religious? But you don't go to hell when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ that is a relationship of value. Religious people do not impress me. All right, what impresses me is somebody that has developed a relationship with Jesus Christ. An atheist is a religious person. They follow the theology of atheism or they are agnostic or whatever. Religion won't get you out of here. I'm a firm believer in a relationship and a relationship is when you get to know him intimately. If your relationship is defined off of receiving all the time, you don't understand the concept of give and it shall be given. We need to understand that our creed is more than religion. It is in reality a system of beliefs that you daily live by. I call it a Christian lifestyle. You see, Christianity to me is a lifestyle. I am a Christian 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm a Christian when I come into this church every single day of the week. Supposedly, I'm not supposed to be here on Tuesday and Saturday, but it don't always work that way, all right? I'm a Christian when I go on vacation. If I go to the beach on vacation, I'm a Christian. I don't wear Speedos. Aren't you so glad I gave you that mind picture? I believe you're godly no matter where you go. Vacation or no vacation. If I happen to go to a movie and they misrepresented what that movie presents, I'm a Christian. I will not feed my mind with the garbage of this world to try to prove to somebody I'm a part of the in crowd. I'm not a part of the in crowd. I'm a part of the out crowd. I'm about to get out of here, hallelujah. The rapture's about to take place. I'm out of here, all right? It's a lifestyle, and walking and talking this creed of life, you cast a shadow of direction on those around you. They desire to become what you are. I took Jonathan to a men's retreat with me one time. He, by this time, was an adult or a young adult, and I'm not saying this to to say, hey, look at pastor. I'm saying this because it impacted my life. And in that men's retreat, I was to speak in three services. It was a father and son deal also. 
and it was Ohio for the Ohio district. And we went into the meeting in the first night. I uh, got up and I introduced Jonathan to share what it was like living in a pastor's home and being my son. And Jonathan, even at that age, was very proficient in his ability to put words together and to speak. But he said something that I took as the highest compliment that a son can give a father. He stood up and he made this statement. He said, guys, I've never had to look for a hero. I've never had to search for a hero in my growing up. My hero has always been my dad. I've watched the way he's lived. I've watched his life. I don't have to search for a hero. That is the greatest compliment I've ever received as a parent from one of my sons. It really was. That has been many, many years ago, and it still impacts my heart and, and my life because I want to live out each one of these elements that makes you a hero. I want my character, my conduct, my conversation, my contribution, and my creed to be that, all right, that brings glory to my God, honor to my wife, and a leadership to my sons, their wives, and my grandkids. Hear me, folks. The devil is after your children. He's after your marriage. He's after your homes. What shadow are you casting right now? We have four different, we have four families now that are expecting, either in the church or connected. Four babies. We're growing. Hallelujah. Amen. I say to every young parent, if you don't have children, take to heart what I'm saying today. Don't just say you're a Christian. Be a Christian. Don't just say what's right. Be what's right. Don't just talk about what needs to be said. Talk the talk. The old saying is, Talk the talk, walk the walk. Amen? Hallelujah. Would you bow your head? Holy Spirit, thank you for allowing me to share my heart. Though I've not enable, been able to cover everything, I thank you for the part you've allowed me to share. Now as we come to this point of unifying, coming together as one, I ask that you would continue to bless this church this group of people. As we take and acknowledge the power of your blood and acknowledge the power of that broken body, we do so with great thanksgiving. For in reality, all that I've said today culminates in our decisions to follow you because you lead us in the way that we should go. I thank you for that. And everyone said, amen. We're going to move, not really move, transition into the latter part of my message today. We're going to be receiving communion. But I want to talk to you for just a moment about communion because today it's family communion. I've never did it like this before, but when I was putting together the message and thinking about Fourth Sunday becoming the Sunday that we really emphasize the authority and the power of the family. I thought, you know what? Families need to take communion together. They need to understand and their children need to understand the power of the broken body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I understand that there are some wee little ones here and that they, they are, are, you know, don't understand and don't know really what this is all about. And I, and I get that. So I'm not saying that your two or your three-year-old should be forced to do something or even allowed that they don't have a full understanding of. But for those that can understand, I want to talk to them for just a moment with just a little bit of time. You see, to, to everyone, we need to understand that right before Christ was crucified, he along with his 12 disciples met in a room we call the upper room. That same room, some days later, was the same room that the Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost. Same room. I've had the honor of being in that room on more than one occasion, even taking communion in the garden, but in that room had a prayer meeting and seen people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in that very same room. Now, history says it is. 
We go by history, it's not always accurate, but yet they feel like that was the room. But it was an upper room, and they gathered with the disciples and what is called, had what is called the Last Supper. Now this was, of course, pre-crucifixion, pre-resurrection. But Jesus began to talk about the future, what was going to be happening, what was going to take place. One of the things that he did there is he tried to explain, not tried, he did explain, the authority and the power of servanthood. Because he began to go around and wash the feet of each disciple. Offense was taken, especially by Peter, over the fact that the Son of God would be kneeling in before him, taking his dusty feet and washing them. Jesus, of course, rebuked Peter. Now, foot washing is not something that we do much in the church today, but I'm still a firm believer in it. It's a part of my upbringing as a child of God. I have no problem with that particular emblem of servanthood. But he began to share the fact of the bread and the blood, of how that the bread represented his soon-to-be broken body and the blood or the juice, the wine represented his blood. And he began to talk of, of what was just about to happen. And so to each one that is present here today, children, I want you to know that what I have here on this table is I have some bread that is unleavened. It has no salt in it. It's basically just meal baked. This represents the broken body of Jesus Christ. A body that was broken that you and I could be free from sin. Disease, poverty, trouble. So when you take this, place it in your mouth, you in reality are taking the broken body of Jesus. Place it on your tongue. Along with the bread, we have the Jews, the fruit of the vine, representing the blood of Jesus. And little ones, as you drink the wine, you symbolically are taking the blood of Jesus. By the stripes on the body, the broken body, you're healed. By the power of the blood, you're saved. You cease to be a sinner because of this blood. You become a saint. The power of redemption stretches beyond salvation into the broken and the wounded body. So I want every young person, I want every child that the parent feels is old, is old enough to drink the blood and eat the body to understand it's the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the, Maha <laughs> Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Today I'm going to ask for any children that are not sitting with parents to move to the parent. If you're already there, that's fine. I'm going to ask for the deacons that are going to be assisting me if they would move to the front at this time. Everyone is standing all around the building. In my studies this week, in my private devotion time, I was in the book of 1 Corinthians and I, got, I was into the 10th and the 11th chapters. I most always go to the book of Luke for this particular part of our worship. I use parts of 
Corinthians for a point of reference. But I saw something in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17 that I never paid any attention to probably the way I should. And I want you to notice something. 16th verse, 10th chapter, 1 Corinthians. Paul writes to the church at Corinth and says, The cup of blessings which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. I saw that and I said, never have I seen that. The body and the blood taken together erases division, erases fragmentation, erases separation. And as you take the body and the blood, you become one. You see, God does not see us as many. God sees us as one. God does not see us as divided. He sees us as one. The body and the blood is the elements of commonality. It does away with anyone being better or less than someone else. The blood and the body places us all in the same position at the foot of Calvary. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And as you take this blood, this body today, you become one with your family, one with your church family. I hate division. I hate cliques in a body. I do not believe there are any big cheese, little cheese, big do, little deed. We're all part of the body of Jesus Christ. And this day, this day, if there be ism or schism, it will be erased by the power of the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. If you believe it, say amen. amen. I'm no better than you are. I was a sinner. I'm saved by grace just like you. Oh, I've got reverend in front of my name. Don't ever even use it. I'm just a man called of God to do what I do. Don't know why he even called me. That was his decision. We're all men and women on the road to heaven trying to get as many with us to go with us as we possibly can. I go now a little bit further into the Word of God. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till He come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the Lord, guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the body of Christ. For this cause... Many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. What does that mean? That means examine yourself. If there's any sin, if there's anything in your heart that depleases God, you drink of the blood and eat of the body of Jesus Christ unworthily. How can I eradicate that? How can It's very simple, very simple. You merely and simply say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Forgive me of my sin, and instantly, it's over with. It's all done, and now you're worthy of the body and the blood. So for just a moment, let us examine ourselves. We do so by closing our eyes, bowing our heads, and say, Holy Spirit, bring to the light in my heart anything that displeases you. Would you examine yourself as I shall? At this moment. Now Jesus. For any sin. That the Holy Spirit is brought to light. For anything. That displeases you. That is in any part of our lives. Let each of us say. Father forgive me. For I have sinned. And we know that at that moment. Forgiveness is asked. Repentance occurs. 
Forgiveness is given. I thank you for the forgiveness of sin in the heart of even a believer who has strayed from the way to any measure. Thank you for the power of the blood. Thank you for the forgiving grace of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen.